You're now listening to Mixed Mental Arts with Brian Callen and Hunter Motz. We're just going to jump right in. I just started it. Well, I'm ready to go, Brian. Yeah, I just started this podcast. Then Mixed Mental Arts. This is Mixed Mental Arts. i got to get a graphic for this. Uh, we do need to get a graphic. We yeah. need to get a whole bunch of things. People want t-shirts, too, which oh, is exciting. On, Merchandising. I'm a mixed mental artist. Yeah. Uh, Hunter, that sweater. Um, <laughs> and that's all I have to say. Like, I, no, let's if, go if into Brian the sweater. Callen, if Brian Callen rubs his face and goes, Hunter, that sweater. And I'm not a dresser. It's yeah. a very, very sexy. It's kind of a rope. It's made of <laughs> rope. And uh, I think it's something that William F. Buckley wore on his <laughs> sailboat. It's the original <laughs> from 1963. Well, Brian, I actually wore this sweater for a very specific reason today. This is, firstly, this is a cricket sweater. Oh, naturally. Um, the longest game in the world. The longest and most boring game in the world. Yeah. It makes baseball look fast-paced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Terrible. Um, but I wore this sweater because do you know who gave me this sweater, Brian? Who? Oh. Johnny Frechette. I love Johnny Frechette. I love Johnny We Frechette. had a friend named Johnny Fabulous, Johnny Frechette, who um, is in many ways one of the most unique, <laughs> beautiful creatures yep. on the planet. John, Johnny uh, designed my house, and at one point um, I said to him, what if uh, we put roses, we grew roses here? And Johnny stopped and, and narrowed his eyes, set his heels, and said, that may be a little too aggressive for this space. <laughs> <laughs> And and he would he would uh, he would explain to me why moss green on this wall say that moss green really gives you a wonderful feeling, and then <laughs> and, and I would say I would say ah why he said well you know it's like it tends to not hurt your eyes and then he stopped and he said I have to leave LA soon you know and I said why he said well. It hurts my eyes to live here because I'm always fixing things when I see how poorly <laughs> things are made and how little care people take in <laughs> in proportion and symmetry and in general beauty. In general, they violate the general <laughs> principles of beauty. I, I, I loved him. I miss him so much. If I had the money, and I'm being dead serious, <laughs> I would be his general benefactor, and I yeah. was for a while. I would just support his. I would support him. Right. I would. I would. I would pay his rent. I would mm-hmm. allow him. He used to paint the same image over and over again. <laughs> it was a very voluptuous black woman, and I'm not kidding. He would paint the exact, but but in different variations. He was a very talented, wonderful guy, and he uh, he he is the guy. I swear to God, I wish I just had the money. I would have him around. And he would be part of my entourage. Mm-hmm. And he would wear the most incredible. He'd wear, he'd show up in like red pants, bright red pants, and a scarf, and some kind of a hat with a feather in it. And he looked like this benign pimp. Yep. He, he was beautiful. He was generally, he, was ge- he generally made the world a beautiful place. My daughter was twirling. Mm-hmm. And of course, I have this joke where I'm watching my daughter twirl, and I can't understand why you turn your back on your enemies like that. It's a bad habit, right? It's irresponsible. (laughs) But she twirls, and the world's just a prettier place as a result. Thank God. Well, and I thought There's no utility there. Well, I think that's the thing is that there is utility. It provides benefit for you, and but 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 to extrapolate, I'm sorry to interrupt because what I was thinking is I'm also working on this idea that human beings create beauty for its own sake, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, This is where I separate human beings from, from smart monkeys in that human beings will. So if I, if we were starving and freezing in the wilderness and Mm -hmm. I came up to you and I said, guys, I don't know how to build a fire, don't know how to trap food. And I'm not sure how to fight that bear that's stalking us. However, (laughs) I can do a flamenco dance. And I started like (laughs) tapping a dance. Yep. It would be of no use, uh, certainly for our survival, but I think it's significant that what we stay alive for has no measurable utility in, in so far as it puts food on our table and it, you know, and it, and it, protects us from the elements and and it keeps our regulates our body temperature blah 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 um yet that is the the, that seems to be this in powerful impulse Mm. not just the ruminations on sort of what does this all mean but sometimes and there's a big difference the idea that i'm going to paint something beautiful I'm going to do something in the air like stand-up comedy that'll go away. Like I've done performances that were that made people laugh so hard, mm-hmm. and it, it's gone. 
Mm -hmm. It'll never be captured. I didn't have it on tape or anything mm -hmm. else. I just put it out there, and there was a temporary moment of satisfaction. I, I, I come out, and I shake hands. People, thank you so much. But, but it's gone. Mm -hmm. And I would do it anyway. I do it for you know for no money. I get paid. But yeah, yeah. so so so. Well, I think I think you know, and I, the reason that's why I wore this sweater to start this podcast off because when we talk about everything that we ended with last time, you know, would I tell a pediatric oncologist not to believe in God? Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't because that gives them meaning. It gives them the ability to figure out their lives. And there is nobody who better exemplifies the spirit animal of you know, maximum, you know, improving sort of the experience of life for people with zero <laughs> practical ability than Johnny Frechette. Yeah. Like, that is Johnny Frechette. Yeah. And I think that we would both agree that the world would be a poorer place without Johnny Frechette. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, but, but, and I don't even know if the, the why is even important. Well, I th this is yeah. I think I think it's worth looking. I mean, I think your stand up is a good example, and I think that anybody <coughs> who's listening to this podcast would not say that you know stand up and comedy and storytelling and art and music don't provide value. And part of what it is is that there's throughout our lives there are these different emotional dynamics. Mm. And what you know, if you look at Aristotle, Aristotle in his Poetics talks about catharsis, and catharsis is this experience of emotional release. And so part of what stand up delivers for you. Is is that you know you're having a terrible day, you know work sucks, uh, you're having a fight with your spouse, uh, things are going poorly, maybe your kid is sick, and you need some sort of escape from that. You need some sort of catharsis, some sort of emotional release, and that's what stand up delivers. Like you look out at your audience, you know people are coming from all sorts of different places, and you're it helping does them. More than that, though, it it, it doesn't mm -hmm. just uh, provide release. I would suggest that it provides inspiration. So when yep. I listen to a great piece of music, I forget that I'm afraid, uh -huh. and I get very generous. Yep. Then I then the song ends, and I have to pee. <laughs> you know, but, but there is something that transports you. That's right. Into I feel when I am shaking hands with all different races and creeds and colors at my shows. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, there's an Indian guy, there's a Spanish guy, there's a black guy, there's a white guy, there's an Asian guy. I genuinely, as I'm in a position of service, I'm standing there, I don't really necessarily always want to go out and shake hands. It's a lot of work. It's, yeah. it's a lot of smiling. It's, an, mm -hmm. it's 35, 40 minutes of taking pictures. and you know. But of course I do it because I'm privileged to do it. Um, but I feel... Generous. I mm -hmm. feel like a better person mm -hmm. because I'm actually, it, 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 even though it, it surprisingly, yes, it's about me and they're all shaking my hand and they love me in that moment. I swear to God, I swear to God, that's that you can get very immune to. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm doing. Yep. The, 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 I feel like a better person because I'm trying, I'm being as generous as I possibly can. I, I, this sounds very like I'm, I'm patting well, my own part. I don't mean it that way. I just mean there's something about that experience where. I am thanking people for coming to see me that makes me feel like my higher self. You, That's probably what it is. Well, exactly. And part of what you're talking about is the difference between motivation 2.0 and motivation 3.0. Yeah. And what you're talking about is the difference between – uh, you know, doing things for yourself and, you know, that experience of transcendence, of being part of something larger. Um, that's that's and of exactly being of right. Service. That's and, right. And, 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 and when I, when, again, yes, and when you see all those races and all those people from them, and they all seem to be coming together around yep. uh, one thing, which is laughter, mm -hmm. and they all get it, mm -hmm. and because I'm trying to be as human as I can with my own emotions. Yep. Um, it, it's just, you kind of go, God, you know, you have these kumbaya moments. Why can't we just all get along? Look at this, you know? Well, and I think that's the point is, is that what, what changes, what makes that kumbaya moment at the end of a stand-up show possible is the emotional context that you've created mm -hmm. because you've created an emotional context. I think part of what you are, Brian, just so that you know, mm -hmm my favorite stand-up comedian of all time. I like hearing that. Yeah. And Ladies the reason, and gentlemen. And the reason why is specific. I'll be at Laugh Boston, you <laughs> bastards. March 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Uh, Laugh Boston in Boston, so get your tickets. Side note, can we talk about the Scottish guy that you had announced your... The Scottish guy. <laughs> yeah, that amazing. Right. I love that guy. I love him. Brian Callan will be at Laugh Boston. He'll be there at Laugh Boston. 2nd, <laughs> 3rd, and 4th. Yeah. Um, 
But the well, you've created an emotional context, and the reason why I love your stand-up comedy in particular is because, uh, in many ways, it reminds me of the best of what was happening with movies in the '80s. And movies in the '80s, there was something you know, people were trying for things; they were aspirational, they were trying to get better. There was hope. There was literally, they were literal. They were, ways. yeah. And um, on on top of all of that, it was all very, it was all very human and very inclusive. And you know, you talk about your father, and you're not talking about. It's not about this very specific, specific big thing. It's this. It becomes this very relatable, universal experience of you know being in awe of someone, and then trying to live up to your father, mm -hmm. trying to live up to that ideal. And that ideal might be your actual father. It might be the founding fathers. It might be uh, a great fighter or a great athlete. I've been thinking a lot about the founding fathers. Lately. Yeah. Which we'll get into, and and so I think the what what we're talking about here is is that what makes those sorts of moments where cultures come together and where cultures are able to exchange ideas is the right emotional context. It's not about an argument over facts. And I think what's interesting, part of what's happened since this whole Sam Harris thing, is people have been saying, you should debate Sam, you should debate Sam, or Sam is so good at debate, you would never beat Sam in a debate. And I've been thinking a lot about what is debate. Yeah. And that, that's that, that in the, that just that statement exactly. is, is to say that the most important thing about debate is <clears throat> that one side wins. Exactly. One side beats you with the sophistry. Mm -hmm. Sophistry meaning that, that some one side is better at formulating arguments, yep. but it doesn't mean you're getting at the truth. Exactly. And it certainly doesn't mean you are moving ideas between each other and, and coming up with a a better way to do things. That's right. That should always be the idea. That yep. should always be what we are trying to do. That, that's right. And, and we talked about that last time where Sam I, – I don't want to be unfair to well, Sam. And, it's but, not, but, and to be clear, it's yeah. not just Sam. Like somebody reached out to, my, to me on Twitter and was like, you should check out Ben Shapiro. And I'd never heard of Ben Shapiro, but Ben Shapiro, he said, is basically like the conservative Sam. And you go and you look at Ben Shapiro's videos on YouTube – and it's all the same words. Ben Shapiro defeats so-and-so. Ben mm. Shapiro humiliates so-and-so. Yeah. Ben Shapiro crushes so-and-so. And then you watch, and it's a different rhetorical set of tricks. What Ben Shapiro does is that, let's say, uh, we present, you, you know, we're talking about, you know, should abortion be allowed? And Ben Shapiro is pro-life because he's conservative. And so you start off and you say, oh, okay, abortion. And he goes, what people don't realize about abortion is, is that the same arguments that were used to defend slavery were used to defend abortion. And you're like, really? Wait, that's interesting and provocative. Let's explore that. And then he says, yes, because it was all about the person was on your property and so you own them. And he gets into some argument like this, and it's the same way with a woman saying her body is her property, and therefore she can dispose of a life any way that she wants. As if, as if a woman's <laughs> body can be... Can be uh, compared to a plantation. Exactly. But what you've done is, is that you've taken this argument, you've reframed it in terms of something we know is morally wrong, and then therefore you follow the line back and say, oh, if slavery was wrong, then so was abortion. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's smoke and mirrors. It's a clever little trick, but it's not, it doesn't help for productive uh, discussion about when when should abortion be allowed or not, which is a difficult, you know, messy issue. Yeah. Well, the, the most the, the powerful argument for for elite for for um, the pro life, the most powerful pro life argument I've heard is is just to say that life begins at conception, mm -hmm. and then to to sort of describe why you know um, how you define what human life is. I mean, right. you can draw comparisons to a. Three week, six week, ten week, whatever it might be, uh, old. Certainly a, a, you know, a twelve week old or or, you know, sixteen week old fetus. Mm -hmm. You can you can draw some distinctions, so some comparisons between that and someone on a feeding tube who's a vegetable. Sure, we wouldn't put that vegetable to sleep, or, or we wouldn't take them off life support, even though we do sometimes. But uh, th th I, th that that was sort of when when I when I when it was described that way. It was difficult to not sort of um, understand and sympathize with, and that's important, by the way, with a pro-lifer. My, my, the way I justify it is that it may very well be, under certain definitions, murder. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, however, I am willing uh, to to say that a woman's sovereignty over her own body 
and whether or not she wants to carry a child to term is uh, supersedes that at least in certain or in most circumstances. Well, you, Why? Because who's going to take care of that child? Well, and you get to there, what you're getting to is is that you know when the argument is framed that way, and if you frame any argument in the right way, it can make emotional sense, and you can be like, oh, thinking in terms of these theoretical principles, I can understand that point of view. Yeah. But then the rubber meets the road, and then you hear about, for example, there's this woman in, I think it's uh, Guatemala, and uh, she has an autoimmune disorder. And so every time she gets pregnant, her immune system reacts more and more and more strongly to the fetus as a foreign object and mm -hmm. attacks it. And she gets sicker and sicker. And so now, you know, and I don't know what's happened with this, but she was pregnant. And it was very clear, the doctors had made it clear, that if she is made to carry the child to She'll term, die. she will die and the child will die. Yeah. So now the rubber hits the road, and you, you can have whatever theoretical principles, whatever theoretical use stance you have, but doctors have to make hard choices. Yes, a lot of pro-life people have always kind of given caveat to that, I think. They've well, always said if the woman's some, life is in danger, then... then well, but you then, know. then you get into, okay, the woman's life is in danger, then you get into... You God's know, will. You get into rape. You get into yeah. incest cases. Yeah. You get into all of these things. And what happens is, is that I'm not... The point is I'm not uh, – my, my feelings on all of this is that I, I don't think that life begins at conception. But let's even just say that life begins at conception. Do I think that, you know, for example, as the Catholic Church used to think that using condoms is a form of abortion and you mm -hmm. should only use coitus interruptus? No, I don't. So somewhere between sex, we'll even start it there, and birth, it gets creepy. <laughs> it does, you know, but I mean uh, tell a tell – a, uh a Tutsi woman who's been gang raped by yeah. a bunch of Hutus and they killed her family that she should carry that child to term. Yep. There, there are a lot. I can, we can get into some hard cases. If you're really that pro-life and you want to save lives, please, please uh, bring the uh, speed limit on the highways down to 30 miles an hour. That's right. And anybody who goes over 35 miles an hour should have their license revoked forever. You'll save. I promise you, you will save. Uh, at least 20,000 lives a year. But if you're that crazy about being pro-life. So we do put a price on life every of day. Of course. And, and, I, and I, I, I think when you live in a society. So my argument, I, I acknowledge that my argument may have some ethical or moral flaws in it mm -hmm. or holes in it. That's why I've always respected. I really have always respected the pro-lifers. They're, 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 I've always respected the Judeo-Christian ethic, the idea that life begins at conception. I don't – that's an emotional but also a religious argument, but also yeah. you can even make a scientific argument for it. So I, I am always very apprehensive even in my own mind to debate this issue. Yeah. And I, I think the point is not that I'm, I'm advocating for any position here – on pro-life, pro-choice. The reality is, is that in order to actually resolve an issue like that, yeah. both sides have to come together. They have to hear each other's side. They have to talk things through. They have to empathize hard with each other. Hard to do, other. though. Hard yeah, to do when exactly. You, hard to do when one side, when both sides are so, and understandably, strident. That's and, right. And not willing up to give any territory. We're talking about trench warfare here. That's I right. Mean, um, the, I understand women that get into the streets when they're worried about a, a Supreme Court justice that may tilt the scale here. Mm -hmm. I get it. If I were a woman and, I, and if I think that, in fact, uh, Roe v. Wade might be overturned, I will be in the streets as well. I am a believer that a woman's right to choose supersedes mm -hmm. the, your concept of when life begins. I really am. I, mm -hmm. And I, I don't care. Yeah, uh, you know, if we're gonna be if we're gonna be this pro life, you better be very consistent. No one's consistent. Exactly, none of us. I'm not. Nobody else is. Well, and also, I mean, if you think about it, imagine if we did reduce the speed limit to 30 miles an hour. What would that do for trade in the world? And then, what would that do to prosperity in the world? That's right. And then, how many people would die because of that? That's well, a good argument. A whole lot of people. Yeah. So the, the reality is, is that when you're dealing with reality, which is annoying and has all these different factors and you have to consider all sides, what you're going to find out is, is that you have to find ways to try and work within your principles, maintain your principles to produce the best solution possible. Mm -hmm. And crucially, I think, you know, the, uh, if we compare the emotional climate at the end of a Brian Callen stand-up show with the emo emotional climate around a conversation about abortion, mm. they could not be more different. Probably. <laughs> Probably. Um, and so 
The point <laughs> is, is that one emotional climate leads to people of all races, colors, and creeds coming together and sharing things, and the other leads to everybody getting super defensive and reactionary and just advocating for more and more extreme positions on either side because they're so worried about what the other side and that's, is going to do. And that's, that is how it happens sometimes in life because there are, there are lines in, uh, uh, that people define themselves along that are willing that, – that, are worth fighting for. I have my my lines, and so mm-hmm. it's difficult sometimes. I sympathize with anybody who's trying to. If I if I thought that there was a group of people who truly believed that socialism or collectivism was the way this country should go, mm-hmm. and wanted to someone like Bernie Sanders, uh, and wanted to um, actually and were and, and really were going to implement in many ways irrevocable policies that would t- tilt our country toward a socialist system mm-hmm. i would fight that and i might mm-hmm. even be i might even be convinced to get somewhat violent because i would consider it a clear and present danger to the constitution and to the greatest the greatest document ever written i mean i i i am such a I, i'm such an anti-socialist in that way i just am i think it's an evil i think uh I don't think the emphasis behind it is. I don't think Bernie Sanders is evil. I think he's a, probably a very generous man. I, uh, but I think he's um, – what's the word? Uh, he's not that smart. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I think he's uh, – he's, he's, that kind of ideology is dangerous, and I actually think it kills. So the point I'm making is that there are certain things that could threaten me to the point where I might even think about solving these issues with some violence, just meaning – if the government thinks they can come in and just take reannex all my property, mm-hmm. you you know I, I can see forming a militia and setting up guns and saying you know over my dead body. I can understand that. Maybe that's the American way. Anyway, that sounds very dramatic. Well, I, I th- wear a bandana as well and a <laughs> loincloth, and I'd have a. I want a belt. I want ammo belts. Yeah. Well, and I think the the key question is what to fight for. That's the big thing. It's knowing where to draw that line in the sand, saying no further. And yeah. um, the the problem is, is that in order to be able to do that, you need a clear and well tested worldview. That's that's, and, that's a huge part. And that is the I mean, for me, that's what I really want out of mixed mental arts is to revolve a worldview, evolve a worldview that is uh, that is grounded as closely as possible in reality. To draw together a broad coalition of people who come from all different disciplines and backgrounds and cultures and faiths and non faiths and whatever else yeah. it may be. So that, although, of course, atheism is a faith, right? It's a belief. Um, It's a belief that God is not there. And that's what's so bizarre in general is that we are creatures of belief. That Mm. is the nature of who we are. And so the question is what to believe. Um, And the point of science is to help us evolve towards more and more uh, realistic beliefs about reality. Um, But I don't think that any physicist would tell you that we've answered the ultimate questions. There are a lot of things that haven't been answered. So... The question is, yeah, the challenge for us is that you take someone like Bernie Sanders or any politician and they, how, you know, how many pages long is the Bernie Sanders or the Donald Trump or the Hillary Clinton platform or the Jeb Bush platform? Mm. It's hugely long and it makes all sorts of assumptions about human nature, assumptions about reality, assumptions about geopolitics, assumptions about where the world is and – you know, I was having this conversation with uh, – I've had this conversation multiple times since calling out people like Tom Woods. And, they, you know, there's an expectation that in order to be able to critique Tom Woods' work, that I should have read all his books, listened to hundreds of hours' worth of podcasts, and then I'm able to evaluate his work. And I, that's not practical. There are 130 million books. There are however many, you know, terabytes of data out there. Mm-hmm. And so the challenge of this age is that there is so much information, and we need shopping criteria in order to be able to quickly parse out situations and to be able to both individually and collectively separate shit from Shinola, the wheat from the chaff, and the shit from the goats. Well, I just had this this sort of – I went on a rant on the fighter and the kid about this. Mm -hmm. Um, because this guy, Kyrie Irving, who's saying the world is flat and I have the science, or I've seen the science. Now, he may be trying to get a rise. Yeah. I think he might be. But um, there is <clears> – <throat> we, we've talked about Alex Jones and these conspiracy theorists. The way I find myself <clears throat> arguing for the 
the fact that vaccines, for the most part, save lives, yeah. antibiotics save lives, uh, that the, the Western science isn't hijacked by a cabal of evil pro-pharma uh, elites, uh, that, that there is, in fact, uh, progress being made in science that is pushing us beyond our biology. If you have Hodgkin's lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, if you have testicular cancer, um, if you have the way my friend has a um, an autoimmune disease that is mm-hmm. affecting his arteries and they're tearing, there are doctors that come in and can save your fucking life, yep. and we have measurable data for that. Mm-hmm. And they are not; uh, they are virtuous. They mm-hmm. are not being controlled by pharmaceutical companies. They are not making a fortune doing it. They are of service. Mm-hmm. They and their awesome nurses mm-hmm. come in and they save lives and sometimes they fall short sure and sometimes they might prescribe medications that maybe they were told were good and they find out they aren't yes things are flawed but for the most part we know that there are certain truisms there are certain facts that the and why well because the um science that goes into our cell phone, the science that allows us to have fresh fruits and vegetables in the middle of the winter and mussels and all that, the science even that goes into my stove, that there are, these things have been figured out Mm -hmm. and we use them and benefit from them every single day. They Mm -hmm. are exact truths. Um, well, I, and, and, and so, so, so when we get into these ridiculous conspiracy theories, this yeah. idea that, you know, that m- the, the marijuana is being, you know, cures all these things and all the pharmaceutical companies don't want you to don't want you to have it because it'll cut into their <laughs> bottom line. Uh, what a simplistic point of view. Well, and that's the, the key thing. And, I, you know, just speaking from the point of science, I think that the word truth itself is very problematic. So, well, you said it. You said yeah. that scientists don't even trust their own brains. Yeah. And, I mean, the, the conspiracy theorist is uh, a, a sort of a weak scientist. They're not – a conspiracy theorist is not a real skeptic no. because the, a true skeptic, you're skeptical of your own thinking, your own ideas, and crucially, you know, the human mind constantly comes up with false positives. So uh, somebody, Scuba Steve on Twitter – uh, said the most important book that he'd ever read was uh, The Believing Brain by Michael Shermer. And so I've been listening to that. And he's talking a lot about... Michael Shermer, the skeptic? Yeah. yeah. Like and him. so he's been talking... And, you know, I think Michael Shermer is a skeptic, but crucially, you know, has very productive conversations in the he's book great. with uh, Francis Collins, who is a geneticist, ran the Human Genome Project, and happens to be a Christian as well. So he appreciates intellectual honesty wherever yeah. it may be found. Love, love um, Michael Shermer. We should get him on the podcast. Which would be amazing. But he's talking about false positives, and the example that he uses, which is a great one, is that if you're in the Serengeti and you hear a rustling in the reeds, well, your brain should overestimate the danger that that is a lion. That's right. Um, And so our brain finds false positives all the time. It is a meaning machine, right? It's man's search for meaning. And so you find meaning where there is none. You find patterns where there are none. There are things that make sense to you that aren't actually grounded in reality. And so the true skeptic, the biggest thing that you have to be skeptical of is your own thoughts. Mm. Because your brain suggests horrible, stupid, dumb ideas all day and finds patterns (laughs) that aren't there. And you have to go through the process of weeding that out in light of evidence. And that's the job of science. Science is about constantly bringing your beliefs into conflict with observable reality. But I think the the important thing to realize is that you're still a creature of belief. You're still relying on belief. You still have these mental models that allow you to parse out reality. But you're breaking the worst ones. And over time, you evolve a more and more useful toolkit that allows you to more quickly parse out situations like your dad, Big Mike, does, where he has the ability to use that pattern recognition, and at a certain point, he can spot duds and he can spot winners much more easily. Mm. And that's that's what pattern recognition is about. That's really what mixed mental arts is about. It's being able to become like the mechanic who can listen to the car engine and know what's wrong. 
And so they don't have to even lift up the hood. They don't have to poke around in there. They've seen the pattern so many times, and they're so clear on the pattern, that even the sound, they Mm -hmm. know what the sound means. And, you know, this is obviously what a great fighter does. It's the ability to quickly pick apart, find the holes in people's games. And it happens, you know, I mean, I'm not a good fighter, so I wouldn't be able to tell you. But as a human, I understand cognitively what that experience is and that you're able to look at all of the data and quickly spot the holes. And that's obviously a large part of what I, as the tutor of death, uh, do with people's thinking is mm. quickly find the holes in people's mental games. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I wish I could do that. It's well, it's a, it's a skill, and that's the yeah. point. And it's a skill that needs to be evolved because what we're now being confronted with with the Internet is the opinions and thoughts of 7 billion people. We're being asked to compete at a far higher level than we were in the 1950s. Yeah. In the 1950s. And what do you listen to? And what do you listen to and who do you trust? And I do think that the, the press is irresponsible in many ways. I mean, the HuffPost and CNN are horseshit. They, 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 they are <clears> – <throat> I do understand uh, Trump, who I don't like, but I can understand his frustration, and he's right. CNN and, and the Huffington Post are harp on horseshit. You know, he says something about Sweden because Ami Horowitz on – he's doing a film, and he talks about that, and it was, it, it was, it was on Fox News. You can understand how, how – Trump would use Sweden as an example because yeah. he had watched Ami Horowitz talk about the fact that Sweden is having, you know, uh, an, an uptick of crimes and rapes and things like that since they've had this very liberal uh, immigration policy. I know a lot of Swedes privately that talk about that. Mm-hmm. So Trump said that, and all of a sudden, the New York Times and the, the Sweden's baffled by this guy, yeah. and everybody's baffled. You don't have to print that stuff. It, it, it's not. It's just not. Um, it's not news. It's you're 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 trying to um, discredit a guy for uh, an off the cuff comment. I don't think. Again, it's. I don't think it's effective. Mm-hmm. I don't. I. Th- I don't think it's uh, true. Mm-hmm. And I think it's um, a bunch of sort of journalists who, for the most part, have integrity and do a good job, but they're being petty. Well, and there's, Don't you? I mean, and there's a, I think in general that that is the key thing is that the world is a very petty place right now. What, and the, the Ari, I'm not getting my information from Ariana Huffington and her <laughs> post. She's a lightweight. I can't well, stand her. I've listened to her many times. We all have to just come together. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, that's the most important <laughs> thing is that we all have to get enough sleep and realize that we're a, we're a community, realize that we are all just together in this thing and we have have to do our part. <laughs> Fucking shut up. Don't tell me anything because you don't know anything. Yeah. I can't so, stand it. So the, the, I think the, the exciting thing about all of this is, is that we don't know who to trust. And once you accept that you don't know who to trust, that's when you really decide to trust no one and just to look at the evidence. Yeah, and, which you can get from in, independent lines of inquiry. You can yeah. get from NPR, from the Wall Street Journal, from the New York Times, from Time Magazine. You can read... A broader swath. That's right. And you need a real diversity of, of intellectual diet. You know, I, you, you have to you, – I mean, obviously, we've been talking a lot about the scientific reformation. So you can go to science, and there's lots and lots of great stuff there. There's also a lot of bad science out there. Um, there are a lot of false positives. Uh, you know, there's a real problem, a replication crisis, particularly in a lot of psych studies, where a lot of these psych studies, when the one of the most basic things is if a psych study or any study, any scientific study is good and it really describes reality, you should be able to do that experiment repeatedly and get the same result. So yeah. if you can't get the same result, then it was a fluke. Yeah. And so what ends up happening is there's no glory in science for redoing other people's experiments. Yeah. Nobody's like, oh, wow, you repeated the experiment. So they have now done studies specifically to try and repeat many of these results, and many of these results don't check out. So right. you can't even trust necessarily the scientific establishment. Um, and, you know, uh, there... Yeah, I mean, there are plenty of neuroscientists that come up with shoddy examples of how the brain works. Exactly. And draw Big conclusion. Sam Harris is guilty of it in some ways. Other people are guilty of it. Neuroscientist is a really big umbrella term. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're right. You've got to be – you've got to always probably lead with doubt and you've got to realize – I mean, for me, 
uh, when I when I get my information, and I do from the New York Times and and various other publications, I formulate a very strong point. And oh, by the way, having lived overseas and and eight years of it in the Arab world, I I get a very strong emotional reaction when Donald Trump says no Muslims mm-hmm. uh, allowed in my country or a variation of that. Yep. And I have a real reaction. And then when I when I hear him talking about building a wall mm-hmm. and deporting all kinds of uh, uh, Latin Americans, I get very angry, yep. and because I my sense of fair play is violated, mm-hmm. even though they're illegal immigrants. I know too many who I, I I see work their ass off, who are desperate. So I have an emotional reaction. However, uh, so so I have very <laughs> strong anti-Trump sentiments as yep. a result of that because I think they're being it, it, what it looks like to me emotionally mm-hmm. is that it's a bunch of white guys with lots of money and power. Who've never, who don't have the empathy, maybe the imagination to understand that people who need help are not, uh, and, and so blah blah blah. So what I do is I I I I, I categorize those guys, and yeah. then I decide they're my enemy. Now, having said that, then yeah. I talk to people who've made a lot of money, who are not necessarily white, not not necessarily um, American. One of whom is actually Arabic. And they have several restaurants. Mm -hmm. And another guy who's a police officer who's not ethnically American. Mm -hmm. And he's a police officer. And he deals with illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. And they deal with – they see firsthand how illegal immigrants tax their business, Mm -hmm. tax the system. Mm -hmm. And they have a very different practical point of view on what illegal immigration does, and it ain't positive. And now all of a sudden I get a very different point of view. Now all of a sudden at least I'm listening, yep. and I go, man, I had a bunch of points of view here that were based on my my reading mm-hmm. at a distance uh, about this situation, and now I'm listening to it on a micro level. And now let me give you another practical point of view on immigration, which mm-hmm. is, is that when they have – tried to put bans on illegal immigrants in agricultural states like Alabama, it has been an economic disaster. That's right. So, you know, if you want to make an st- argument from economics, well, now you get into that. But reality is a bitch, right? Mm. She's a very complex bitch. She's a complex bitch. <laughs> and, you know, I, it's maybe not even fair to say that she's a bitch. It may be more fair to say that we haven't really taken the time to understand her. We haven't listened to her. We haven't really tried to understand where reality is coming from, what reality's point of view is. But they, it's very easy to peddle these simplistic answers of you have to get rid of the government. The FDA is the problem. If you remove that, all your problems will be solved. You know, oh, you have to get rid of religion. Islam is the problem. Islam is the mother load of bad ideas, as Sam Harris says. These very simple narratives that, that sell well. Fundamentalism sells well. It's much easier to tell that story, and you can wrap that up and justify it in a whole bunch of facts, than to actually get into into the ring and get into the practicalities of, okay, we've been in the Arab world. We know what the Arab world is like. What do you do on the ground to help the Arab people succeed, to educate their kids, to achieve their dreams? There's a big difference between being Sam Harris sitting in Brentwood and critiquing the Arab world and being Malala Yousafzai, who goes out there and is promoting education for girls and gets shot in the head for her troubles. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about... I love how good you are with names. Malala <laughs> Yousafzai. Yousafzai. But, but I, and I've been thinking a lot about Teddy Roosevelt. And um, I've been thinking a lot about the progressive era when Teddy Roosevelt was alive. So funny. If, you, if you're wondering what Hunter's thinking about, if you see him in person, <laughs> he's thinking about Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. But Teddy Roosevelt was, I mean, you know, this great figure, right? He was this, you know, as a young man, he wasn't physically strong. And uh, he, you know, his father said to him, he says, Teddy, you've got a great mind, but your body just isn't up to it. And now you must make yourself a body. And so he goes out and he lifts weights and he does a program to physically strengthen himself. Boxes and wrestles. Boxes and wrestles. And when they talk about Roosevelt's White House, the fascinating thing was the cast of characters that came through. Mm -hmm. There were people who, you know, 
are hunters, you know, big game hunters. They chased wolves, they boxed, they were explorers, they were, you know, Native American, they were judo champs, they were philosophers, intellectuals. You know, he really was a great mixed mental artist. Mm -hmm. And Teddy Roosevelt has this great quote, one of my favorites of all time, which is, is that it is not the critic who counts. It is the man in the ring. Damn right. And I think w w to, so. part of what was so <clears throat> terrible about 2016 was is that it was the year of critics. It was people who sat and they, from their armchairs, they pontificated about how to solve the problems of the world rather than getting into the ring and trying to figure out, okay, practically, how can we move things forward? What are the next moves? That should always be where we start discussion. That's right. That, 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 it's not about winning the argument. That's right. You know, um, that was why that Steven Crowder thing with Rogan was so fascinating to mm -hmm. me because you could see Joe got triggered emotionally. He, he, what I love about Joe, of course, is that he, he realized that and yeah. posted a long apology, but it was very interesting to see him sort of, and we all have these triggers mm -hmm. and you know, uh, the, the, it's very difficult not to kind of remind yourself to forget. It's very easy to forget that that's where you should start. What yep. are we trying to do here? Exactly. And listen, we all get triggered. I get triggered. Certain things trigger me. I got, <laughs> I got triggered when all of the new atheists came out to attack me. It happens. Mm -hmm. But the, the, in the end, the, I think the interesting question is, what problem are you trying to solve? And part of the reason why I deliberately triggered the new atheists was because I, as for me, and people have asked me, you know, somebody tweeted out, you know, oh, tell me one time that Hunter Motz has ever admitted that he was wrong on the podcast. And everybody was like, he did it on literally the last episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but for me, you know, like you, I mean, you have this great line that we saw great poverty from inside an air-conditioned car. And so there's always been this strong emotional desire to – uh, fix the problems of the world. Why should we be in that car and have so much? And then these kids who just happen to be born into a different family in a different country with a different passport don't. And so that's been the big emotional drive for me. And the, the, probably the most powerful experience of my life emotionally happened to me in the Sahara Desert mm -hmm. in 2007 uh, in Libya. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd, at that point, I'd been, you know, reading a bunch of this science on emotions, people like Ekman and Kahneman. But it was then in the Sahara Desert of Libya that I read John Hyde's Happiness Hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And I was humbled. I was humiliated. And I was humiliated because I thought I had known so much because I'd gone to Harvard and I'd majored in biochemistry. And then to find out that all that science, which I cherished so much, had done was to rediscover what we already knew. Mm. That was humiliating. Why? Well, so, so, so in other words, it rediscovered what that we thought was the core, The core principles of how humans think and how humans work. So no, notably the idea that, for example, Descartes' error. Mm. When, I, when Jesus says, love thy neighbor as thyself, right. what is he saying? He's saying that thinking and feeling are linked. Because yeah. when you're in an argument with someone, all you can see are their faults and everything that's wrong with them, and you throw things at them. Well, this is what you see with... The news yeah. and the political discourse That's out right. there. This is what you – I mean this is what I do uh, with Trump. I think I'm right. Uh, <laughs> I, all I see is a monarch and a dictator yeah. and, a, and, a, and, a, and a textbook bus and truck version of Putin. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference being that this guy is emotionally rash, has no control. He's just, he's just a, a bundle of impulses whereas Putin is – cold calculated and one's a narcissist the other's a sociopath there are two differences <laughs> you know um but the, but i think the, i think the the, the challenge is right anyway, i went off on no, a no, no 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 but i think i think the challenge is there that um it's it's easy to say uh, very often you'll find that people have these principles like oh we should never judge people and the problem is you can't live your life that way you have to judge people and the analogy that i use is dating so when you're dating someone, what you're doing is there's all these things that are happening. You go out, you get dinner, you spend time together, you have walks, you have conversations, you have fights, you make up. And what you're trying to do is, is that you're trying to take all of that data and you're trying to find the patterns in their behavior. Who is this person? What makes them tick? And is this someone that I can grow a relationship with and build with? Mm. And there, I, I dated um, an alcoholic. Uh, she was a recovering alcoholic. It was one of the most fascinating experiences of my life because addicts are the best 
at justifying their behavior. I've dated one. Yeah. Lived they're, with one. They're literally the best at justifying their behavior. Yeah. And so what happened is, is that over the course of our relationship, she was amazing at spinning narratives, at, you know, convincing me of certain Do things. Do you know how to tell when an addict is lying? No. When their lips are moving. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but there comes a certain point at which you've gone through the washing machine enough that you're done. Mm -hmm. And you've sussed out the pattern of the behavior. You know where this person is coming from. Do they have good qualities? Yes, they have good qualities. But the point is, is that, you know, the, it's, it's clear that it's not workable. And so I think it's the same thing that we're in this position with the access to 7 billion people, someone like Donald Trump where, or Sam Harris or Tom Woods or any of these guys or Alex Jones where we've now – it's clear what your deal is and that maybe there are certain things you get right. Maybe you can justify your behavior. But on balance, your behavior is not constructive and it's not helpful and you need to be called out. Now, can you change your behavior? Absolutely. Donald Trump could be the greatest president in the United States. If tomorrow he went out on TV and was like, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I actually have no idea how to run a country, let alone the world's most complicated economy and democracy. So here's what we're going to do. It was never supposed to be about me. Democracy is about the wisdom of crowds, and we're going to pull together as a country. I'm going to listen to everybody, all sides and all perspectives. You're all going to be my team of rivals, and together we're going to figure this thing out. And he would be on the path to be the greatest president of the United States. Mm. The problem is, I don't think he's going to do that. And the reason why I don't think he's going to do that is because he is so committed to the idea that he is a genius and has it all figured out. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's called, again, it's, it's, a, it's a condition. It's a medical condition. It's a pathology <laughs> called narcissism. Well, it's a particular psychology for it's sure. He's, he's a true narcissist. <laughs> it's, called, it's called narcissist. It's called a narcissist. There's no cure for narcissism other than go away. Well, but there, I think there is a cure, and the cure is humiliation. Um, well, the Wall Street Journal kind of like said that he may be Gulliver and tied down by you know a thousand little ants, little ant people, you know, just a thousand different regulations, and and the, the Democrats are coming at him, and the press is coming at him, and the courts are coming at him, and you know. And see, that's a plausible narrative. There are a million plausible narratives out there. Mm -hmm. But the, I think the key thing is what is the emotional place that you're coming from? And for me, I spent uh, – there's a, there's a great, great line. You know Harvey, the Jimmy Stewart movie? Mm -mm. It's an amazing movie. And so um, what, the, what the movie is about is, you know, it's Harvey who is played by Jimmy Stewart – or Jimmy Stewart who plays uh, this character who has this big – this imaginary friend, Harvey, who is a six-foot white rabbit that's invisible. And – um, and he wanders around this town, and all these people, there are all these doctors who think he's nuts because he has this imaginary friend. But periodically, he lends Harvey to people. So he lends his imaginary friend to this doctor, and this doctor, who is so busy trying to psychoanalyze him, suddenly finds this release and this freedom that comes from spending time with Harvey. Mm. And afterwards, he's, you know, the doctor says, fly specks, fly specks. I've been spending my life staring at fly specks when all the time there have been miracles hanging out on the corner of, I don't remember what it is. But, um, you know, at the end of the movie, what Harvey, uh, what, what uh, Jimmy Stewart's character says is that, you know, he said, to get by in this world, my mother said you have to be oh so smart or oh so pleasant. Well, I tried smart. And I decided that pleasant was much more enjoyable. <laughs> and, and for that's me, great. that's what that moment in the Sahara Desert was about. I spent the first part of my life trying to be so smart and to know it all. Mm. And then, thanks to John Haidt, I was humiliated. Mm. I was brought low. I knew how much I didn't know. And I knew that, so the, the, the point is, is that Jesus had understood the basic problem of human affairs. The basic problem of human affairs is that our emotions create reality. And they create this idea that this person is all evil or that this person is all good. Binary sort of and, kind of thinking. Or whatever emotion that it comes from, or fear, or humility, or arrogance, or love, or hate. And the key is, and we do this in, in, in our interpersonal relationships, you have a fight with someone, and you realize at a certain point that you're just saying things back and forth. Mm. You're just saying whatever you can to hurt the other person. And it's going nowhere productive. And so what you do is that you switch the emotional state. You switch. You drop out of anger. 
and then you drop into a place of apologizing, humility, trying to figure it out, trying to understand the other person's point of view, and you deliberately change the emotional climate of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And when you change the emotional climate of the conversation, that's when the problem starts being solved. Not when you're trying to win the debate, but when you're trying to understand the other person's side and the other person's point of view. Right. And so the challenge for us, Brian, is to create that emotional climate on a planet-wide scale. <laughs> mm. And it's quite a difficult challenge. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but I do think that when you can organize thoughts the way you do, um, it's very helpful because a lot of times people just get so frustrated and overwhelmed with mm -hmm. how to solve a problem. Um, you know, I'd love to help. You know, they're, they're, I have excess income sometimes, and I'd like to put that income into something that would really make a difference for, for example, uh, children in the inner city, mm -hmm. i.e. black and browns. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to do something. I always think about that. Um, especially black children because um, I just think, you know, it's – I hate to single that out, but it's emotionally true. I just think that we have large sections of our – there's a legacy. Mm -hmm. There's a legacy of damage left behind that um, still hasn't been um, – reckoned with and yeah we're, we're paying a price for it they're paying a price for it more importantly well i, I, but I don't I think see we, black I, owned businesses i don't see enough black professionals i don't see any of that shit it's just not fair it's not about being liberal it's not about being you know a good guy i just don't like unfairness i just don't like having a lot and then seeing other people who don't mm -hmm. because they just never had a fucking chance it right. bothers me man well and i but think i don't know how to fix that well, but I think that's the point is what we what we need to do and what I want to do and my hope for this is to build a community of people who are committed to practically fixing problems. And practically and, fixing problems. And, and doing that's... whatever it takes to fix them, you know, and that we're we don't care about what the ideology is. Our only no. ideology is whatever works. It's like being a doctor. Yeah. Just do no harm. Like Doctors Without Borders, mm -hmm. who which is an organization I actually give money to. This is not this is not a political agenda, man. These right. people who are dying. That's right. And they go into where other people aren't willing to do, and they they save people's lives. Mm -hmm. Fuck their badasses. Yeah. Um, le, le le médecin sans frontières. <laughs> médecin sans frontières. <laughs> médecin sans frontières. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I speak French. Um, and apparently the French wells up in you, and sometimes it just needs to come out. Mais c'est vrai, <laughs> parce que je suis français et, et, et américain. <laughs> je suis très fort, mais mon cœur, mon cœur, c'est très grand. Oh, grand? Ouais. Ouais? So I have a very big heart. Is no, that right? Oui, that, that is, that that is right. right. J'ai un grand cœur. Tu as raison, Brian Callan. Merci, <laughs> on terre. De rien, de rien. Uh, D'accord. Alors, uh, bienvenue. Mesdames, mesdames <laughs> et messieurs, uh, nous sommes finis <laughs> le podcast. <laughs> et uh, j'espère que tu, uh, tu comment, tu, comment tu as dit, uh, tu l'aimes ça, cet uh, podcast. Tu as apprendu. Apprendu. Or vous avez learn. apprendu, learn, learn, ap apprendre. Ouais, ouais, ouais. Ouais. J'espère Je, que vous avez apprendre. Well, I'm glad that this has turned into a French ouais. lesson. <laughs> Cette leçon. Um, uh, but, but I think that's the, you know, I think we've been doing mixed mental arts now for a while. I'm sorry, I don't speak uh, English. <laughs> okay. Alors, nous, nous, nous avons, nous avons, uh, nous avons fait uh, mixed mental arts. Ouais, ouais, ouais. Ouais. Uh, pour pour, oui, euh, trois mois. Pff, trois mois, ouais. Ouais. Et alors, nous devons euh, décider ouais. euh, que euh, nous allons faire ouais. avec Mix Mental Arts ouais. euh, pour améliorer le monde. Ouais. Ouais. Améliorer le monde. <laughs> We're going to fix the, the world. So, I, it's just the, the I, I, you know, I think it's just important to recognize that 
there are all these critics, and we can get wrapped up in all their their justifications for their shitty behavior. Right. But in the end of the day, a lot of it comes down to you know how does Joseph Welch end McCarthyism? He ends it with have a, you no decency, decency, sir? And that's what it comes down to. It doesn't really matter how you justify your shitty behavior. Either you're really trying to understand the other person's point of view and engaging with reality and engaging with the. And this is what I love. It's it's interesting, like. It, one of the great things about doing this podcast, and there are many great things besides being able to be in your presence, Brian. Um, but one of the great things is that I now have the world's greatest book recommendation system because all of the listeners send me great book recommendations. And I also have the world's greatest team of rivals mm. because there are both people who are encouraging what I'm doing and people who are challenging what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And some people are just throwing shit at me and some of the people raise really great objections. Mm -hmm. And as they do this, my thinking evolves. But one of the most consistent patterns in the recommendations that I get is Dan Carlin. Everybody is like, Dan Carlin is so him. great. You need to get Dan Carlin Dan on. Carlin. I would love to get Dan Carlin on. But the reason why I love Dan Carlin is because Dan Carlin isn't about theoretical principles. He looks at what actually happened in history yeah. and what can we learn from those mistakes and those lessons. And that is what the Founding Fathers did. The Founding Fathers yeah, exactly had right. a fairly low tolerance for political theories and were primarily interested in the, the, the laboratory of history. Yeah. What had happened in different human societies? Why had it gone right? They and were why wary it gone of standing wrong? armies, and That's, they were very wary yep. of, of, of common men with big ambition and authoritarian streaks like <laughs> Donald Trump, for real. Yeah. And you can see how lucky we are mm -hmm. that we have all these checks and balances. And, uh, and, and an the independent great, press, uh, a judiciary, mm -hmm. it's, in, it's beautiful. And I think the, the great challenge of, of you know, what, what went wrong in 2016 is, is that we now have uh, – everybody has a microphone. Everybody has the ability to broadcast their thoughts. And inevitably, there are snake oil salesmen. There are people who don't have a lot of integrity – who will sell simplistic narratives that allow them to acquire a following and personal fame and personal money and personal power. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be some check on that. Mm -hmm. There needs to be some group of individuals who are willing to go out there and fight the bad ideas. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a ninja army, a group of people who follow Bushido. <laughs> Bushido! <laughs> well, thank God we're not in Russia because the other yeah. side would just shoot us. Well, exactly. Uh, or harass us and scare the shit out of us because they'd have their, their thick necks, their rough necks mm -hmm. come in and break your legs. But so we need to – I think that's what – part. We, there's a bunch of things that we have to do. One is to empower people with the ideas, the best ideas available, the best that's being thought and said so that everybody has a framework for you know, sorting through their own lives, education – you know, uh, figuring out how to have better relationships, how to do better in life, fitness, uh, which is something I definitely want to learn. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, but we also, there is... You should is, be lifting weights. I should just be lifting For weights. Real. Yeah. You should just be doing, you should just be doing straight bar shit. You should yeah. just be doing snatch and cleans. Yeah. Deadlifts. Yeah. Squats and bench. Yeah. Literally. And then, and then you do, uh, you play a sport, you do some boxing. I've been doing boxing. Days. Yeah. And but, but lifting weights for you, is excellent good. idea. You're a big man, yeah. And you should just you should just get strong as shit, yeah. Whether it's CrossFit or whatever, and just CrossFit's a bitch because it's an hour and yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. I don't know. I would just lift heavy weights if I were you. Okay, that's my that's Brian's and rec. Then, yeah, and then eat. Um, try to stay away from the simple carbs. No, oh, yeah, carbs, the enemy of greatness. I mean, I can carbs are good, but just, yeah. just uh, more like potatoes, rice, yams, uh, and vegetables, not. Bread and pasta. Not like the piece of muffins. bread you gave me downstairs. Yeah, that was a tight yeah. piece. That's all I've had today. <laughs> Ladies and um, gentlemen, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna cut this short now. Um, well, not short actually. We are right at where we usually end. Yeah, um, it's good stuff. But there are bad ideas that need to be taken down, Brian, and we need to strategize. At fifty years old, I think it's time to fight. Yep, I really do. I mean, I'm not. I was thinking about that the other day. I'm not really interested in being liked anymore. No, I'm interested in um, fighting the good fight. That is what I am talking about, Brian County. Yeah, we just yeah. high five the <laughs> bastards. Monday. We'll see you later, kids. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you learned everything.
You've been listening to Mixed Mental Arts with Brian Callen and Hunter Motz. For more information and past episodes, please visit briancallen.com and mixedmentalarts.club. Also, be sure to follow the show on Twitter at Mixed Mental Arts. Until next time, bye-bye.